What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Post Gazette Sports Now YouTube channel and podcast network. I'm Noah Hiles. She is Abby Schnabel. Abby, <laughs> no easy way to put it. It is just not a good basketball season in Pittsburgh right now. It just isn't. Uh, a lot of teams, a lot of losses. One big win, which we'll talk about, but I think, you know, we got to start the show talking about the two teams in Pittsburgh um, who both entered this year with, I think, reasonably high expectations. Duquesne, I think, had the higher set of expectations as far as their program standard goes, but Pitt was expected to also be a lot better than what it currently is. Um, Panthers are now, what, one in five in ACC play? And Duquesne's 0-4 in Atlantic 10 play. Um, both teams are barely above 500. Pitt 10 and 7. Duquesne 9 and 7. Neither team with a quad one victory. Uh, and both of them outside the top 75 in Ken Palm now, and outside the top 75 in the net rankings as well. So Abby, just looking at everything now. Granted, you know Pitt could maybe earn an auto bid if it basically won out in ACC play, uh, or maybe it could lose this Duke game and then lose out or win out. Uh, I think that would get it in or something close to it. Duquesne would have to win the Atlantic 10 tournament at this point. So with the big dance, the ultimate goal out of the picture, what are these two teams playing for? That's our question for today. What are Duke or Duquesne and Pitt playing for at this point in the season? I'll let you start. So I'm going to, I'll, I'll start with Pitt. I think Pitt really at this point is, you know, hoping for postseason in the NIT or the CBI. And I think both of those are, um, you know, realistic expectations. I think uh, this, Pitt, I just feel like this Pitt team and this Duquesne team at the same time, they're both having this issue where they just can't find consistency and connect. Like they all have, both teams have great pieces, but they just can't seem to gel. And so I think for Pitt, this season is now turned to um, how do we develop our young guys? Um, uh, specifically, Jalen Lowe, uh, Bub Carrington, with the asterisk on Bub Carrington of he could try and go to the NBA after this year. Um, but I, I, I mean, but even players like the DS Graham twins, they're still young guys. And, you know, with the level of ACC, I feel like this is a great time to really just sit back, focus on the basics, you know, try and win games still, obviously that's always the goal, but really, really, really focus on the development of these young guys. Um, and then also try and get some fun upsets just to cause chaos. Like at this point, cause you really, like you said, it's pretty unlikely at this point that they're going to make it unless they win out. Um, but, like, you know, might as well. Like, they, they've got some good games coming up. Like, I mean, Duke, Clemson, NC State. Duke's ranked. Clemson and NC State received votes in the AP poll this week. Um, and so it's just like, you know, might as well. Like, what do they have to lose at this point to try different combinations to try and develop players? So that's what I think for Pitt. For Duquesne, I really do think that they're still trying for that NCAA tournament, and it's going to, like you said, come down to um, the A-10 tournament. But let's be real. It was always going to come down to the A-10 tournament right. for Duquesne, and so I think that's why they haven't like lost steam in that goal. Like They haven't scratched it out yet. Uh, I mean, in a very fiery press conference with Keith, uh, with Keith Dambra on Tuesday night, he said, listen, we are starting to get better and you can see it. And I agree. I do. You know, you look at their losses and you look at their record and you think this is a bad team. I think it's, it sucks that this team has been marred with injuries with who was supposed to be their starting center, Dushan um, Morchich and Trey Williams, who's been a starter for them. Um, both of them are back in the starting or in the starting lineup. Uh you got guys coming off the bench like Jake DeMichael, who's a, who's a walk on literally like scoring 12 points against Dayton, getting steals over two of Dayton's guards, which that's a feat within and of itself. And I and even uh, at the Richmond game the other night, they played really well for a solid 37 minutes. And I'm not going to blame their loss completely on the refs because they did outscore get outscored eight and two in the final three minutes. But like, you know, there was a lot of controversy with some of the calls and lack thereof last night that they really just hindered them. 
And and so I feel it, but but last night I really enjoyed watching that team. And so I feel like if this team can finally click and we're finally seeing that they have the capabilities to click, you need Day Day Grant. He's has a concussion right now. You need him out of concussion protocol. I don't see why they can't go to the A10 tournament and not get a win. It's not like they have had other than the UMass game. All of their games have been within 10 points. I mean, losing to Dayton by 10, exactly. That's not, like, I was impressed with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, only losing by two to Richmond. Richmond's undefeated in A-10 play right now. And so I don't see, with with the fact that they've Duquesne has been in every single game that they've played, minus maybe two, I don't see why they couldn't go down or go up to Brooklyn and knock out a pair of wins and make it into the NCAA tournament. Um, they don't have the best success in the A-10 tournament, but I don't know. They have all of the pieces. They just need to connect. Yeah. Um, I'll start with Duquesne. I'm not covering them as close as you are, Abby, but just as someone who has covered Duquesne in the past and who's just kind of followed from afar for pretty much my whole life since I got interested in sports, the thing you need to know about Duquesne is they're always going to have unfortunate luck. That's just the story of the program. <laughs> um there, there are times where it does look like it's coming together. And I, I recall the 2020 season or the 2021 season, uh, the pandemic year where all the games are getting canceled. I, th- I still think that was Keith Gambrot's best team. He, he had a ton of returning talent and the pandemic kind of ruined it for him before it even got started. Guys were just getting sick. Guys transferred out mid-season, and that group never really reached its full potential. And he had to kind of rebuild a couple of years since then. He built a team that is really talented this year. But like you said, Abby, I mean, there's injuries. There's slow starts. There's just coming this close to getting a nice win over a Princeton or a Nebraska in non-conference play. And then there's, you know, the officials. And you can feel that frustration with Coach Dambrot, but I think the difference between Duquesne and Pitt is the remainder of this regular season, Duquesne is playing for the best seed possible in the Atlantic 10 tournament. That's that's the thing. I mean, if if they still finish conference play with a, a fairly decent record and get themselves in a spot where they don't have to, if they can get a bye or a double bye, you know, something like that where if they can create a feasible or a, a realistic road where they can win in just a couple of games. I wouldn't count them out, but yeah. they need to go and do that. That's mm-hmm. what their goal is. It's, it's not, <clears throat> you know, you're not going to win the league in the regular season, but if you can get, I don't know how many teams get a double buy in the, in the conference bracket. Um, but if you can, you know, finish top four, top five in that league and set yourself up with a realistic path, to make a run, that's the goal if you're Duquesne. Yeah. Where if you're Pitt, it's not the goal. Your your goal this year is to, I think, above all else, you cannot finish under 500. Mm-hmm. That just that is the sign of maybe last year was just a one off. I personally don't think it was. I think that they do have talented players. I think Capel will continue to bring in talent. Um, and I think maybe they overestimate. I think they built a roster last year with the intention of Dior Johnson being there and with the intention of Papa Kante being healthy. And once again, they're, they're down two scholarship guys and yeah, they're, they're hurting. I mean, they're, they're not getting the production that they need anywhere. They can't make shots. So I think the ceiling is the NIT. I think if this team right now can finish the year and get a bid to the NIT, that's a tremendous success because that's that's kind of what the expectation was nationally for this team was to be just outside. If they can finish to in a similar spot to where maybe like a Wake Forest finished last year, uh, a Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech's actually a really good example where they stunk in the beginning of the year and they kind of found their footing in February and March. And it was too late for them to get any March Madness consideration, but they, they got some nice wins. In, in the later end of ACC play. And that's what Pitt should strive for. And it's got to come from, like what you said, Abby, it's got to come from their younger players. Jalen Lowe and Bub Carrington need to start every game. 
from here on out. And I'm not sure what the future of their front court is. I don't, I'm not sure it's going to be the twins or Fetty Federico. Uh, there, there has to be some sort of development here, but yeah, I, I think that that's, you're, you're, you're playing every game with the understanding that this is going to make the team better next season. Mm-hmm. And if that means, you know, taking some bumps along the road, that's going to have to be the case. Um, and like I said, I still think best case scenario, if this team can return to its form, how it was playing in November and early December, even if in its losses against Clemson, um, I still think it can be an NIT team. But right now, yeah, you you're playing for program stability yeah. because if you if you finish right ahead of Louisville toward the bottom of the ACC standings, you're looking at guys wanting to transfer out. You're mm-hmm. looking at a very hard sell in the transfer portal to incoming players. You're looking at a coach who has had one winning season in in what would it be six years then. So that's not a great overall spot for the program. So you need to at least have a winning season and put yourself into a spot where you can sell this year as a rebuild, which it was for all intents and purposes, but you would have just thought that the rebuild would have gone better. So those, those are my two things. If you're pit, you're fighting for culture. You're fighting for your future to be sustainable and if you're Duquesne, you're fighting for the best positions possible mm-hmm. in the Atlantic 10 tournament. We'll move on now to the highlight portion of the show. Uh, Abby, Penn State with a huge win over the Badgers of Wisconsin, number 11. I believe that's their first Big Ten loss on the year. It is. The Nittany Lions handed them. Penn State wins the game 87-83. Uh, they improved to 3-4 and four in the Big Ten, 9-9 overall. I'm going to start off with just my comments on this because I don't have a ton. I know you have a lot more. I have a ton. (laughs) I'll just say this. Um, Does this win do anything for Penn State right now? Probably not. No. It's not going to put it into the tournament conversation. It's not going to really impact much as far as its prowess in this year's Big Ten. What this win could be remembered as, or will actually be remembered as, regardless of what the future holds, it's Mike Rhodes' first signature victory. Mm-hmm. And that means something. When you're trying to build a program where, I mean, there wasn't a lot of stability with Penn State basketball. Micah Shrewsbury built it up to something decent last year. Uh, and it was competitive in a very, very strong league. Um, and when he left, it was kind of assumed that, all right, well, back to being the fifth priority at Penn State <laughs> as far as the athletic department is concerned. Um, but, you know, you win games like this. And it's a selling point. It's a selling point to guys on your roster who might not stick around if you can't win games like this. It's a selling point to the guys you're recruiting out of high school. It's a selling point to what you have to offer that, hey, Mm -hmm. we can beat a Wisconsin. And if Wisconsin can beat an Illinois, or if you can beat Wisconsin, you can beat any team in the Big Ten. And that's what a win like this does. So that's big for Coach Rhodes. Abby, like I said, like you said, you've got a lot more on this, so go ahead. Yeah, so I didn't get to watch the whole game um, just because, you know, I was covering Duquesne. But when I did get home, there was about 10 minutes left in the game, um, and Penn State had a four-point lead at the time. Um, and I think that's what's important to note is that Wisconsin only had the lead once in that entire game, and it was for 17 seconds. And I think that's what's more notable to me is that Penn State led – almost from start to finish. There were a handful of ties, don't get me wrong, but the fact that this Penn State team, which is still coming together, a hodgepodge mix of people from all over the place, is was able to do that to such a solid Wisconsin team. Like, Because you got to think, this starting five, all but one of them has been playing with each other for two, three years, some of them. And so the fact that this Penn State team was able to lead for all but Um, or Wisconsin only led for 17 seconds. Like, that's impressive to me. I think also what's so impressive is, I mean, their backcourt duo of Kanye Clary, 27 points from Kanye Clary and 20 from Ace Baldwin Jr. Like, again, against a really strong defensive Wisconsin team, that's impressive. And I also think that's huge for Kanye Clary too because I had heard rumblings of, is he going to stay? 
for another year. And I think if he, he, like, he can point to this, not only is it Mike Rhodes' marquee win, but this is Kanye Clary's marquee win. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that I was just so impressed with, again, I only got to see 10 minutes of the game, but one thing I noticed was Kudus Wahab's presence down low was wow. And he's going up against seven foot, or yeah, seven foot Stephen Crowley. Kudus Wahab is 6'11. So, like, but Stephen Crowell is very battle tested in the Big Ten. And literally, Kudus Wahab got four blocks in that game. Uh, and all of them were just wow moments too. Like, and I think that's what was more exciting for me was I have had very little excitement about this Penn state team just because it was rebuilding. And we had a lot of excitement of last year's Penn state team. This made me excited for them. This made me excited for the future. Um, and you know, I like that they shook things up. Like, I mean, handing Wisconsin who's leading the big 10, their first win, like that's fun. Like I love an upset. So that, that helps. And, I don't know. I think it just speaks a lot to what Mike Rhodes has done with this program so far and uh, the future to come. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, so on the note of coaches and achieving, we'll move on to the prediction part of our show. Uh, well, Mike Rhodes, I feel like as I mean, he's celebrating <laughs> right now. He's happy. There's a lot of unhappy coaches in the area for college basketball. So I want to ask Abby for our prediction. Hot seat rankings heading into this offseason. If things continue to trend the way they do. Rank these three in order for whose seat is the hottest to the least hot. Jeff Capel, Keith Dambrot, and Andy Toole. I'm mad that you took Eiler out of there because that was my cop out. I was going to say Josh Eiler from West Virginia. Yeah. no, I, 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 I think his seat, does he have a seat? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, uh, okay. So I think two things to keep in consideration is, um, con one thing to keep in consideration is contracts. Um, because at this point I don't really see any of these teams really wanting to buy out a contract. Um, and tool is extended through 26, 2020. He was extended in 2020 after they had, um, clinched a, an auto bid for the NCAA tournament. They extended him until 2026. Hasn't done much with the team since. Um, and Capel was also extended in 2020 to be 2027. Um, so I don't really see, but I just, I just like, it's hard for me to rank them because I don't really see Tool or, uh, I don't see Pitt or RMU really wanting to spend the money to buy out these coaches, especially Capel with how successful he did have that team. But like you said, if they lose, have a losing season, he's only had one winning season. Mm -hmm. And um, with Tool, I don't know. It's hard to, again, it's hard to grasp. I don't see RMU buying him out. So I don't feel like he's on a super hot seat. But at the same time, like they haven't been very good since that 2020 year. You know, that the, the overtime win on Friday was super fun, super exciting. And he has a handful of wins like that. But like if you're looking for sustained success, I wonder how much he is on the hot seat. So I'm cheating the question because I'm not ranking them. I'm just talking through my thoughts. The interesting one to me is, is Keith Dambrot because his contract is up at the end of this year. Um. I don't necessarily think he's on the hot seat though, because I think that they really like him and he has like, there has been some, some, some substantial growth. Like the three or two years ago, three years ago, they were six and 24. And then the season after that last season was 20, uh, 20 and 13. Right. I think what's more likely with Duquesne and Keith Dambra is that he's going to retire if anything, because end of his contract, they might not want to re-sign him just because they haven't gone to an NCAA tournament. But I don't think, like, I don't necessarily view that as a hot seat because it might just be his time, and I think he recognizes that. So I guess if I had to put anyone on the hot seat, I'm going to say Capel just because you do have this huge year of success and now this kind of really bad down year. But I don't, I don't know. I don't really think any of them per se are on the hot seat. So, I don't know, convoluted answer. I talked through it, but what what are your thoughts? I would put Jeff at number one. I'd yeah. put Keith at number two, and I would put Andy at number three. Uh, Andy Tool is just going to coach at RMU as long as he wants to. <laughs> um, like you said, I mean, he's extended long. He's been there a long time. I would be I, – I mean, and we've just seen through other moves how serious they take 
that athletic department at times. So, I mean, I, I don't see them in a hurry to try to buy out a guy that has brought a lot of success to that program, albeit long time ago. But I mean, it's <laughs> Pittsburgh. If you win in the postseason 10 years ago, it still means something apparently. Yeah. Um, <laughs> for other coaches anyway. Uh, so we, we, that's who I'd have at three. I agree with everything you said about Dan Brott. I think they like him. Um, retirement does seem likely with him just in the sense where it's like, it's almost impossible to win it a mid major now mm-hmm. with portal the way it is and not having, I mean, Duquesne can't have a lot of NIL resources <laughs> and there's some mid majors that do. I'm, I'm sure Dayton has a lot more to work with, or, I mean, you could go around like San Diego state or like a mountain West team or something like that. Like there, there's just more to work with for, the more sustained mid majors. And if you're not one of that, I don't know, I would say maybe five to 10, that group of five to 10 mid majors who every now and then goes to the sweet 16 or the elite eight, or maybe even the final four or is consistently fighting for the tournament. If you're not in that crowd, it's really hard to get in there there now because the moment you have any sort of talent, it's gone. Mm -hmm. It's gone. That that's the new, minor league system for the power five or the group of six, or, you know, the power six, it's the Atlantic 10, it's conferences like that. And, you know, when Dan Brott took this job, he had a mission, but this wasn't part of the mission. He didn't know that this was coming. So I could see him at his age, just being like, I've had enough. And he, he made Duquesne better, but I think if there is a parting of ways, it's on his terms, not the university's. Yeah. Where if you look at Capel, I don't think he'll be fired at the end of this year regardless. Um, buyout is part of it. I also think that, you know, he bought himself some goodwill with last year's season. Mm-hmm. But I do think that there is a chance he, he comes into the next season with a pretty hot seat, depending on a couple of factors. One, you have to consider who the athletic director will be. If Heather likes not, no longer around, I think Capel's seat does warm up. Uh, just because his relationship with like is what allowed her to keep trusting him and build that tournament team last year. I don't know if that will be the case if they bring in someone new, if it's an outside hire. Now, if they hire someone who is from like staff or someone who's already within the pit athletic department, then yeah, he might be okay. But if they bring in, if it's an outside hire, I don't know what that means for Jeff Capel long-term. It might be like, the beginning of last season where it's, Hey, you got to do something now. If Mm -hmm. not like we, they have to move on. Um, that's a factor. And I, I also think that how bad this year gets is a factor and what happens at the end of the year. If, if they finish five and 15 in the ACC and Carrington leaves and, you know, other guys leave and they can't add anybody in the portal, That's not good. Your program needs to give at least a little bit of hope moving forward. And I still think there's a lot of hope. I really like their recruiting class. I think Jeff Capel's always been able to identify talent and bring it in. Um, And again, like I think their roster construction kind of got screwed over by things outside of their control with injuries and Dior Johnson getting kicked out of school. The team that Capel built was a lot better than this team because Mm -hmm. it's not all the way out there right now, but they're going to have to make some tough decisions in the off season about maybe asking some guys to go try their hand elsewhere and and freeing up some roster spots so they can make more than just one or two additions in the portal. So I would say Capel's seat will probably be the hottest, uh, but there's a chance. I I think that none of these guys will be on the hot seat, but then in in another world, all three of them might be. So yeah, that's where I'm at. I think I agree with you 100%. Um, you put it, the ranking into better terms than yeah. I did. Um, I think one thing that could potentially benefit Pitt is is that they ha- do have recent success, and there are outside people that really like Capel. 
And the fact that they're not likely going to make it into the NCAA tournament means they're able to hop on those um, transfer portal, those early entry right. transfer portal people a lot sooner than some of those other teams. And so if Capel can make a good pitch to some of these really standout mid-major guys that want to go play for a Power 6 program, I think that's almost a benefit. Like, I mean, it's something that's talked about often is that it does. Transfer portal opens during the NCAA tournament, and some of those coaches can't split focus when they're trying vying for a national championship and that's one area i think you we can we should add um or clarify um is is how does he do in the portal especially considering the fact that he um is going to have more time than other yeah. power six teams so um i'm i don't know i'm excited i'm excited for all of these programs next year all of them right now are pretty disappointing I'm zero for four over the last week. That could be uh, zero for five by the time this podcast comes out because I'm covering RMU tomorrow or tonight. But, like, I need some excitement in basketball, and I think next year these teams could be really exciting. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, it's it's hard to project anybody being good next year because you don't know who will be around. But yeah. there is reason to be optimistic about the future, but the future can change at any point in time. So. Mm-hmm. That's all we got for today. Thank you, Abby, as always. Uh, and thank you to everyone who tuned in. You can keep tuning into all of our Pittsburgh sports coverage at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette by subscribing to our podcast channel and our YouTube channel. She's Abby Schnabel. I'm Noah Hiles. We'll see you next time. Thank you for checking out this content from Post-Gazette Sports. If you watch this video on YouTube, please like the video and subscribe to our channel. For all of the sports coverage the Post-Gazette has to offer, visit post-gazette.com.